That's the line. I'm not trying to say like, oh, Damon's secretly a softie. I would like to see more scheming and less screaming. Okay, I would like to know why, like what convinced him? People are more complicated than that. House of the Dragon, episode seven. This episode felt just so iconic to me, by which I mean, it just, I, I don't, <laughs> I don't mean to say that it is iconic necessarily, but it felt iconic. And there's a few reasons for this, I think. One of the biggest reasons, so that's, I'm just gonna talk about it first. As usual, I have divided my notes into sections, but I just wanted to open by talking about how many trailer lines we got in this episode. And every time one hit, it's kind of like when you watch The Sixth Sense and Haley Joel Osment says you can see dead people, you're like, that's the line. So we had three that I clocked. There might be more, so let me know. From Corliss Valarian, we got two, and from Otto Hightower, we got one. And uh, these lines didn't just feel uh, iconic because they're from the trailer, but they feel a little bit all together, all three of them do feel a little bit like the thesis of the show, if there is one. Anyway, so those, if you if you missed them somehow, those were Corliss Velaryon saying, what is this brief mortal life if not the pursuit of a legacy? Corliss Velaryon shortly thereafter says that history does not remember blood, it remembers names. And then we have Otto Hightower speaking to Alicent and saying, we play an ugly game. You have the determination to win it. Which are three really, really excellent lines. I mean, I can see they were chosen for the trailer because they are so, they have a feeling of being iconic and they are such a good encapsulation of the themes of the show. So anyway, I just enjoyed those moments. I was the Leonardo DiCaprio meme going, that's, that's the line. Okay, but so episode seven, I did have a lot going on as usual. These episodes are quite crammed. There is no dead weight in these episodes. As usual, my notes uh, don't really have hard dividing lines, but I've kind of divided them between sort of like, there's, there's a lot of like sort of group moments in the show. So I've kind of talked about them as a, a separate section where like this scene I unpack. And they also have separate notes about like specific characters and what kind of goes on with them for the whole episode. That's kind of what I'm doing here. So let's start out by talking about the funeral scene, which the funeral scene kind of felt like an interesting paralleling or an interesting echo of the wedding scene. So in the wedding scene, I talked about how, despite my problems with kind of how that scene ends, how brilliant it was, the way that we sort of had Viserys, sitting there and kind of oblivious to the turmoil around him, turmoil that is at least in part caused by his either actions or inactions. So here at the funeral, we saw something a little bit similar in, in that we see a lot of those same characters that were at the wedding, sort of a, a reunion <laughs> of that guest list. Obviously some people absent, the Lena, the person they're there to mourn, as well as Harwin, obviously, because he died in the previous episode. And Viserys kind of, again, oblivious to all the tensions around him. Uh, during the funeral, we once again, just see a lot of efficient storytelling. Like there's so many characters and so many dynamics and so many things that have to happen kind of off screen, just kind of move things along. So we don't waste a lot of time establishing that Otto Hightower is the hand of the king. We just quickly show the pin and we're like, he's hand of the king again. Don't need any more. They just trust the audience. We got it. We saw the pin. We know what's up. Uh, we see an interesting echoing or paralleling, um, not for something that happened in House of the Dragon, but for Game of Thrones. And the episode does this quite a few times. And it's not, you know, super aggressive and overt, but it's it's there in a way that's, it's it feels more like, you know, history repeating itself kind of feeling. So Otto Hightower is, is once again handed to the king and we get this scene where he finds Aegon, who a lot of people have already compared to Joffrey, with uh, understandably so, drunk and sitting by himself. And Otto is very Tywin Lannister about going and kind of manhandling his royal grandson, like the one person that doesn't have to take any shit and like has his own schemes and plans and is more of a force to be reckoned with than this kind of like pathetic royal princeling. Uh, later on in the episode we also kind of, the dynamic between Otto Hightower and Alicent is a little bit similar to Tywin and, and Cersei, although Otto seems more supportive of Alicent um, than Tywin is of Cersei. I really enjoyed um, how during the funeral scene, we saw a kind of huge variety of how grief manifests itself, kind of all going on at the same time. And again, they didn't belabor that point or overdo it at all, but there was just like so many different kind of reactions to the death of Lena that we got to see there. And I, I just enjoyed, again, the variety, because there's there's very, I feel like bad writing will just say, you know, death equals sad and insult equals mad. You know, it's very like one note, very, very simple, but like, Grief is complex, humans are complex, not everyone responds to death in the exact same way. So seeing how the kids are dealing with, seeing how Damon's dealing with it, seeing how her parents are dealing with it, seeing how Alicent doesn't care. I just, I thought that was very, very well handled. It felt like a very rich scene. Again, similar to the wedding where there's just like so much going on both emotionally and politically between everybody who's present there. I did kind of break my heart when Corliss was talking to his grandson and telling him how he's gonna inherit Driftmark and he says he doesn't want it, which I'm not gonna lie, I did laugh at first because it just reminded me of Jon Snow saying, I don't want it. <laughs> but when he explained that he doesn't want to inherit Driftmark because if he's inherited it, that means everyone's dead. That broke my heart. Now, Damon does laugh a bit during the sort of funeral rite, but you do get the sense that he's not like, he doesn't not care at all that Lena's dead. It does seem to bother him that like, 
he is grieving at least a little bit. I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to say like, oh, Damon's secretly a softie. I'm not saying that, but like, you know, again, people are more complicated than that. I think the way he feels about Lena is quite different from how he felt about his first wife. I mean, he, we saw like, he did care about her. She wasn't nothing to him. He care, I'm, I'm very sad that they cut the scene of him in the previous episode, um, holding, hugging his daughters after Lena dies. Um, so since they cut that scene, it would have been nice to see him kind of grieving with his daughters here at the funeral, but they, maybe they cut that scene as well. Maybe they did originally have that. But nevertheless, even though they cut these softer sides of Damon from the show, it still does seem like he is bothered that she's dead. It doesn't, she doesn't mean nothing to him. And later when he's talking to Rainier about her too, you know, like he, he's not flippant about it. He's like, you know, he's not gonna say that he was in love with her or anything like that, because that would not be true. But she wasn't nothing to him. It was a bit strange to me. Um, maybe you can explain it to me why Corliss Valarian has such a big problem with Lenor um, going out to the sea to grieve his sister. That reaction seemed, if a bit, you know, emotional for a man uh, in this kind of environment and in this setting, I don't know, it, it felt, appropriate for a brother to grieve his sister that way. I didn't see anything about it that would be scandalous or gossip worthy or that I, I just didn't get why Corliss was so upset by that, that he would say, hey, go go get him uh, to his boyfriend. Like that seems more like you're creating a more of a scandal with that. So I, I really didn't understand that scene or like why Corliss was reacting the way he was. But yeah, it's kind of tragic to see how much Viserys still wants a daemon with him. And really, um, obviously the daemon's a big part of it, but you really just do get the sense that Viserys' heart is with his family, like his, you know, his blood relations that he feels sort of parted from nowadays, that he's with Alicent and, and Alicent's kids and like kind of that's the team that he's surrounded by now. And it's pretty clear like when he goes up to Damon and is like once again like, oh, you come back, it's fine. You're, you're unbanished, like it's fine. I miss you, come back. I'll, I'll be there for you. You have a place by my side. Like after everything, once again, he's like, I want Damon back. And he's he seems quite happy to see Damon again, even under such sad circumstances. Uh, again, much, much later in the episode, when, and we'll get to that in more detail, but I mean, when he takes Rainier aside against Alicent, and in the funeral scene, he calls Alicent Emma. So it's just, it's pretty clear, if it wasn't already all along, that Viserys, his heart is with his his daughter and his brother and his his Targaryen family, not with Alicent or, or his kids with Alicent. So moving on then to Rhaenyra and Daemon. Um, I kind of like that, I mean, for all that the show does kind of speed through things, I did kind of appreciate that they did just kind of like get right to it with Daemon and Rhaenyra because this is inevitable. They've been building this for a while. Uh, no one is under any illusions about how these two feel about each other. So that it's just kind of like, we're like, all right, we're doing it. <laughs> uh, just kind of cut right to the chase. So I appreciated that because you're like, yeah. I, I do still think um, it would have been nice to see more of Harwin and Lena. I do stand by that. But that being said, that being in my mind still the best case scenario for the show, um, I do still think that um, now that we saw the conversation between Rhaenyra and Damon, where they're each kind of talking about who Lena and Harwin were to them, I sort of felt like, I don't know if this is going to make sense or I can explain it in a way that makes sense, but the basically like what Damon and Rhaenyra in the story of the show know about Lena and Harwin is what the other tells them about them. So Damon doesn't really like, didn't really personally observe or know much about Harwin. And similarly, Rhaenyra didn't really personally observe or know much about Lena and her relationship with Damon, other than just knowing that it, it exists. So I feel like then the audience similarly only knows about them what they are telling each other. And so their experience of these characters is just like Damon's and Rhaenyra's where uh, Damon only knows what Rainier has to say about it. Rainier only knows what Damon has to say about it. And the audience likewise kind of only knows what they have to say about it. I don't know if that makes sense. I enjoyed how, um, again, I don't know if I necessarily call this an echoing or anything, um, but the way that when Rainiera is pitching to Damon the idea of them uniting, or their union, that she basically puts it in the same terms with the same arguments and the same reasoning that Damon gave to Viserys when he himself proposed this very thing, which Rhaenyra obviously wouldn't know anything about. So I just like the way that it kind of shows once again, and the show has done this many times, to once again show us how much these two are alike, that they think the same, they act the same, their priorities are kind of the same, their strategies and, and logic and approach to things is the same. So Rhaenyra pitches Damon's own plan to Damon uh, without knowing that that's what she's doing. So I thought that was a clever way of yet again, just showing 
how sort of simpatico they are. Now, skipping a little bit towards uh, to the end of the episode, I was about to have a big problem with the idea that Rhaenyra would sign off on the cold-blooded murder of Laenor, particularly because of how Rhaenyra has been in the show so far, which the characters, it doesn't matter if like something that they do or say something from the book, if like that's not consistent with how the character has been written in a show so far. So the Rhaenyra in the show just abruptly doing a 180 and being willing to murder Laenor just so she can be with Daemon would be a little out of left field especially like it would be left out it would be out of left field no matter what but particularly given the conversation that she had just had with Lanor telling him that he's a good and honorable man and that's a that's a rare thing and that you know she doesn't wish he'd be any different than he is like it seemed a very a, a sort of heartfelt moment between them so to on the heels of that call for his murder was a bit much to swallow and I was like really so I was Kind of like my initial reaction then upon seeing that Lainor is alive, I was like, oh, okay, yeah. Actually, yeah, I was like, Rhaenyra wouldn't murder him. Okay. But then immediately after that, I was like, hang on a second. Wait, so Lainor, was he in on it? Like when they, when the guy attacked him, like did they stage that together? Had they talked about that beforehand? We're like, let's stage a scene where you're trying to kill me. And then obviously they did have to murder somebody so they'd have a body for the fire. And like, you know, who who explained this to Leonor and what made him go, yes, this seems necessary. I agree, I should fake my own death. And it's just, it's a hell of a thing for him to do to his parents after they just lost Lena to then fake his own death. Like, I just feel like I would like to see the conversation that convinced Leonor that this was the way to go. Cause that's a lot for him to give up. The, everything he's ever known, his title, his position, his money. Um, his, he just said that, you know, he cares for, even though those kids aren't actually like his by blood, he does care for the kids he has with Rhaenyra. It's just, that's a lot to ask of him and for her to be, him to be like, okay, I <laughs> just, okay, I would like to know why, like what convinced him? You know, it's too bad that Lainor wasn't the one that Kristen wanted to run away with because it turns out that Lainor would have been totally down. But yeah, I, I it did enjoy, before we found out, I think it was before we found out that Lainor was actually alive. Um, that again, Rhaenyra and Damon sort of plotting this whole thing and then uh, speculating that they, they, people will ask questions and there will be rumors and people will assume that sh they're behind this, that people will talk and the way that they're kind of accepting slash intentionally creating barbaric reputations for themselves, which are, you know, more than they apparently deserve, that it might be... <laughs> While scandalous, it might be useful to have people think you're capable of something so dark, but that would be an intentional choice on their part to let it look like they did it. That being said though, if people will speculate that Rhaenyra and Daemon are behind it, how does um, Corlys and the rest of the Valarians feel about that? You know, they seemed to be siding with Rhaenyra in this episode, as, as you'd expect, so. Uh, moving on then to Rhaenyra and Alicent, which is kind of what this whole show is about, right? At least so far. So I've kind of accepted, you know, the new Alicent is who she is starting from the previous episode. So like, you know, going into this one, you know, I'm, I'm expecting this new version of Alicent, which to me still feels like a completely different character from the previous Alicent. But whatever, we've moved on. This is, this is who Alicent is now. So moving forward, that's who we're dealing with. And I still think that how much she speaks up against Viserys in public. So like a lot of people were saying to me that like, that it's totally believable that she could get away with talking back to Viserys. And and maybe, possibly, um, I would agree, but she does it in public. And that's where I really find a problem with it because I feel like it's not just Viserys that would need to let her get away with this. Like the rest of like people would be like, you can't talk to your king like that, you know? It's just, there's just certain things that you just aren't done, you know, in, in public like that. So the way she talks in front of him, to him, in front of other people is still a bit much for me <laughs> to swallow for this sort of time and place that's being depicted. And the way she like contradicts him and, and asks the guards to basically, not just that she's getting away with speaking against the king, but she's act, asking other people to listen to her over the king. Like that is bold, <laughs> very bold. Uh, we've seen a consistent sort of theme of the way that Alicent is kind of obsessed with Rhaenyra in a way that Rhaenyra is not obsessed with Alicent. So like we often see these scenes where Alicent is the one watching Rhaenyra and Rhaenyra will notice and look back, but she wasn't watching Alicent. She doesn't give a, like she doesn't care what Alicent is doing. It's just like whatever. Like and I don't I don't mean to say that you know Rhaenyra is so dumb that she wouldn't realize that Alicent is a threat, but you know she's she's concentrated on her own plans, her own schemes, her own efforts, her own life, and then Alicent is sometimes a problem. But she's not like so obsessed with Alicent the way that Alicent is clearly obsessed with Rhaenyra and is constantly worried about what Rhaenyra is saying and doing and what she's where she's going and what's happening with her. So I think they've done a good job of sort of like demonstrating that in many scenes in subtle ways and then 
Obviously, in confrontations, we see that sort of bubble up to the surface, the way that Allison is so preoccupied with Rhaenyra. And Rhaenyra is like, I gotta get over it. Uh, and that said, Rhaenyra does seem to think better of Alicent than Alicent thinks of Rhaenyra. Alicent is ready to assume the worst at all times about Rhaenyra. Uh, by contrast, when Damon is talking to um, Rhaenyra about the fire in Harrenhal and Rhaenyra says she doesn't think Alicent is capable of cold-blooded murder like that, that she doesn't think Alicent would be the one that did it. Now, I do think that scene would have been a little more interesting if, as I suggested in my previous video about the previous episode, um, as I said in the book, there is speculation about who caused the fire at Harrenhal. It's not a certainty in the book. And that Larry Strong is one of the candidates, one of the options, but that Daemon Targaryen is also one of the several options. If they had kept that ambiguity alive, this little chat on the beach between Daemon and Rhaenyra about what happened in Harrenhal would have been just a little bit more interesting if we, the audience, had some reason to think that Daemon might possibly have done it himself. So how was he going to say to this? But I feel like ultimately their goal with this episode, or one of the many goals of this episode, is to just show how much Daemon and Rhaenyra are kind of on the same page, which would undermine that a bit. Granted. But yeah, I definitely got the feeling that, you know, Allison, again, she thinks the worst of Rhaenyra all the time, but you also get the sense that it's only at the end of this episode that Allison realizes that she's been dealing with the sort of meek version of Rhaenyra thus far. And it's only at the end of this episode when Rhaenyra is with Damon that she's kind of like come into her own in terms of sort of confidence about her position, at which point Allison is like, oh shit. <laughs> she was dealing with the nice, let's make peace Rhaenyra this whole time, and Rhaenyra has reached her limit and Rhaenyra has Daemon now. So it, it definitely felt like Alicent like thought that this, you know, she was dealing with the worst version of Rhaenyra this whole time, but she didn't know how bad it could get, if that makes sense. I'm not saying that like Rhaenyra was evil at the end of this episode or anything, but it was a, a bolder Rhaenyra than Rhaenyra than Alicent has dealt with up to this point. So it's sort of like, oh, you thought it was bad before. Well, I'll show you how bad it can be. Uh, the kids in this episode were fantastic. I think they did a great job um, in a very short amount of time in the previous episode, setting up who each of them is, their individual personalities and what the tensions are. I mean, obviously, the tensions between the kids are sort of picked up by osmosis from their parents, but they themselves have their own rivalries that have developed just on their own, based on their own personalities. So I think they did a good job setting that up so that in this episode it feels just as fraught as what's going on with the parents. It, did, it was a little weird to me that it seems that they, unless I missed it, let me know if I did, um, but I think they betrothed Aegon and Helena off screen, because last time we checked Rhaenyra was suggesting that Helena be betrothed to her son. And now we heard Aegon talking about the fact that he's betrothed to Helena. So again, maybe I missed it, but I don't think they ever showed us a scene establishing that that had been decided. So that just felt kind of strange, like, wait, since when? But yeah, like the kids, again, the tensions between the kids, the actors playing the kids are doing a great job. And so I feel like it's really, really earned that moment after uh, Aemon takes the dragon and he runs into his, uh, I was going to say cousins, but they're his, well, let's not think too much about <laughs> the family lines. But anyway, when he runs into the other kids and we have that intense altercation where he loses an eye. I feel like they did a, that, that moment did come out of nowhere. It felt very earned and the tensions between the kids felt like fraught, like it felt highly charged. And honestly, that was much more believable to me than Kristen beating Joffrey to a pulp, which did seem to come out of nowhere. This scene between the kids felt very earned and, and was very well done. Then we get the big confrontation with the parents. And again, I think the visual storytelling here was as usual, fantastic, the way that we sort of visually saw the battle lines being drawn about who's standing on which side of the room, the way that Viserys is kind of standing in the middle of it all, but there's kind of no one on his side. He's kind of an island of indecision and obliviousness while the sides are being chosen around him. We've sort of continued here this trend. Um, it's not like a, a cut and dry trend. You feel free to disagree, but this is kind of my feeling of how things have progressed with Rhaenyra and Alicent um, on a repeated and recurring and consistent basis where Alicent is the one to kind of like strike first. And I mean a lot of things by that. I don't necessarily mean that she's always attacking Rhaenyra. Just go with me on this. <laughs> that Alicent slash Alicent's side is the one to always strike first, but Alicent and Alicent's side is usually the weaker for it or is punished for it or doesn't come out on top despite being the aggressor, if that makes sense. And again, I don't, when I say aggressor, I don't necessarily mean she's like trying to fight her all the time. So my sort of examples of this are, Initially, in, in the very beginning of this all, um, you know, the two of them are supposedly friends, which is a, it's just a departure from the book and that's fine. So the first person to sort of do something to fracture the friendship is Alicent, not Rhaenyra, by going behind everyone's back and hanging out with the king. And yes, her father made her do it, but that is neither here nor there. And it's certainly not something that Rhaenyra would be aware of. So regardless of who pushed who into it, it does happen behind Rhaenyra's back and would feel like a betrayal of that friendship. And so you know, maybe it's not Alicent's fault, 
um, that it happened that way. You know, she just kowtowed to her father. But nonetheless, something like that breaks a friendship. You can't go back to being friends like you were before. That's it's not, not an expectation you can have. But so Alicent does this, so she strikes first, but Rhaenyra remains the heir and kind of does what she, whatever she wants. And she doesn't, there aren't really any consequences for her then turning around and lying. Again, she doesn't really lie to Alicent, but for her keeping her own secrets from Alicent. She doesn't really get punished for this. There aren't any repercussions for this. And with Aemond, who would be, you know, on Alicent's side when he seizes the dragon, I know he gained a dragon, but he did not need to lose an eye to gain a dragon. When he'd confronted his siblings, he was the one that sort of struck first in terms of being the aggressor and throwing insults first. And so while he was the sort of one to strike first, he's the one that lost an eye. And then here in the room between the parents, Alicent draws blood, literally draws blood from Rhaenyra with a knife. And at the end of that confrontation, the series is pretty clearly on Rhaenyra's side, if he's on anyone's side. He's definitely not siding with Alicent. So it's consistently kind of, it feels like Alicent slash her side are reaching and grabbing and striking and trying to do something, but it's Rhaenyra and her side that come out on top. Uh, so to speak. So again, it's not like a consistent, like, I hope I was clear about what I meant about those things. Um, so it, it just it seems like a pattern in this relationship and in this dynamic. I definitely enjoyed seeing during this confrontation the way that Damon was happy to be a bystander and just sort of like sit this one out and watch it unfold and wait till kind of um, the victor emerges. <laughs> he's not gonna get into the thick of it just to to begin with. And not just that he's waiting, but he's also seems to be just kind of enjoying the chaos, the tensions that he's for once not the cause of. <laughs> so I thought it was, a, a, again, you know, it, it wasn't a, an aggressive handling of that characterization, but it felt extremely appropriate that, that would, that's what Damon would be doing right now. You're like, yes, that's so Damon of him right now. <laughs> so I just feel like they're, they're consistently good at sort of showing characters behaving in ways other than Alicent. <laughs> <laughs> that are consistent for who they are in their characterization and continues to develop that further. Allison demanding that Kristen take the eye of one of Rhaenyra's kids um, in front of everybody, overriding the king's express command and telling Kristen that he's sworn to her, not to the king, even though, I mean, everyone is sworn to the king. That's just how this works. That was a bit much, even for Kristen. <laughs> but I mean, in general, like that scene, I was just like, I mean, I know Viserys lets people get away with a lot, but I, I was just kind of shocked at like how kind of no one in the room reacted to this. I mean, when she attacks Rhaenyra, you know, again, I just, I mean, I know, again, Viserys is kind of, you know, infamous for his inaction, um, that he kind of lets people get away with stuff. But there's like lots of guards in the room and like, you know, it just, it felt like, I, I, so is no one gonna do something about this? Like that was, it was a bit ridiculous. It was a bit Cersei Lannister of her to just kind of be unhinged like that in that scene. It was a tad much. It felt a little bit like the way that Cersei is, becomes completely irrational when it comes to like Tyrion Lannister being around that she wants him dead and she won't trust him and she just like loses it and sees red is kind of how it felt now between uh, Rhaenyra and Alicent by the end where Rhaenyra is the Tyrion, so to speak. So it was, it was a little bit much, but overall I did think the scene worked and it was very tense. And um, again, battle lines were drawn. So overall, I did think this was a pretty fantastic episode. I have very, my issues with it, if I have any um, are more just sort of like things that are carryovers from the previous episodes. Again, like not a super big fan of Allison's characterization in general, but especially as it is inconsistent with the previous depiction of Allison. If this is how Allison was going to be all along, I don't necessarily care for it. I would like to see more scheming and less screaming, more subtle from her character. But if that's how she was going to be all along, I feel like younger Allison should have begun to go down this path a little bit sooner so it wouldn't feel so like two different people. Again, I enjoyed a lot of the ways that it did echo Game of Thrones, feeling kind of like history's repeating itself at times with again, the way that there's a lot of kind of like Lannister <laughs> influence in how things are going down. Um, so I, I enjoyed those sort of like echoes um, those, I, I, they don't feel like fan service. They don't feel like, huh, recognize this? Is this familiar? It doesn't feel like that at all. It feels much more like, again, history repeating itself and the way that these dynamics have a way of kind of similar things happen when people are put in similar circumstances and there's similar rivalries. And the Game of Thrones is a, a cyclical game that the players may change, but the game remains the same almost, if that makes sense. I do think the pacing is a little fast because we're getting another time skip um, in the next episode. I'm excited to see the adult versus the kids because you know that will be exciting. They'll be able to participate more actively in the story when they're not kids, but it is a bit fast. I do think if the showrunners had known what a hit this show would be, they would have taken a little more time with things. I suspect that they were concerned they would lose their audience if they didn't get to the, hurry up and get to the Dance of the Dragons. Obviously I don't know that for a fact, but it does feel a tad too fast just a tad. Like I think it, the show would benefit from a little bit of breathing room, a little bit of time spent kind of 
digesting and sitting with some of the events of the show overall. But that said, given the kind of constraints they have with how quickly they need to get through these events, I do think they're doing a good job of conveying the important information and helping us along to go through this story. So I think ideally it would be a little slower, but for being, if it needs to be this fast, they're doing a good job with it. Um, the child actors were fantastic. So I don't, I, I, we were with uh, Rhaenyra and Alicent longer. So I don't know that I can say I will miss them the same way because we didn't really see them that much, but they did a great job. And, you know, child actors are, are harder to find um, or like that can act very convincingly and very well. I oftentimes just kind of don't expect it and I'm impressed if I find it. So they did very good. They did a very good job, the, the child actors. Um, I felt that Rhaenyra and Damon's dynamic in this, um, particularly in this episode, it did feel very much like a continuation of the dynamic between Damon and Rhaenyra that we'd seen previously with the previous um, Rhaenyra. So I thought the the not just the actors looking the same or the script being the same, but it felt like between the two actors, the, the chemistry between them, it felt like a just more mature version of what they had before. So just like I said in the previous episode, this older version of Rhaenyra very much works for me and not just in how Rhaenyra is acting in isolation, but Rhaenyra's dynamic and chemistry with other characters around also feels consistent. And it's really important that it feels consistent with Damon in particular. And I think that it really does. As always, the music, the cinematography, the costumes, the sets, all of that is gorgeous, fantastic, well-crafted, well done. Always feels immersive, always feels consistent for the world. Um, I haven't mentioned it before, but the dragons, the dragons are used very well and are, are done very well. They look, as much as you can say something like this about a dragon, they look very realistic. Like. They don't just feel like, oh, a fantasy creature that can fly around and breathe fire. I mean, the dimensions, the weight, the size, the danger, everything about the dragons, it feels very real. Their wingspan, everything about them, it feels less like a fancy magical creature and more like a very large, you know, like a dinosaur, you know, like it feels, again, the only word I can think of is realistic, which is a weird word to apply to a dragon, but I think you know what I mean. And I think not only are they realistic, um, I think the show utilizes them very well. It doesn't overuse them, partly probably because of the CGI budget, but they also, the scenes where they utilize dragons, they aren't just, wow, what a cool visual. The dragons are always used, just like everything in the show is always used, to further the story, to further the plot, to further character development. So scenes with dragons always feel even more epic for that because it's not just like, oh, cool visual, how epic. It's how epic because it is epic for story reasons. It is epic for character reasons. And so, yes, it is a cool visual, but it's that much cooler because there is more to it, more underpinning it than just the visual. So yeah, those are my thoughts on episode seven. It's a great show. I'm going to be sad when it's over. It just feels like it's going by so fast, even though at the end of each episode, I'm like, oh my God, I have to wait a whole nother week for the next one. But I can't believe we're already through seven episodes. So we're gonna, have to, they're only gonna start shooting season two next year. So we're gonna have to wait a while before we get the next installment. But let me know your thoughts in the comments down below about this episode, about the show in general. Uh, do you agree or disagree with me? Whatever, let me know. I post videos on Saturdays, other random times well, but definitely Saturdays. So like and subscribe, join my Patreon if you feel so inclined. And I'll see you when I see you. Bye.